Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you have been with us lately, you know we were reading in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to continue that this session. I turn to Hebrews 6 uh, and start with verse 4. Hebrews 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away, to renew them again into the repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Lots of words for a concept there. He kind of summarizes that in Hebrews 10. Go to Hebrews 10, turn your Bible there, and then to verse 26. And it says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Hmm. That sounds like a pretty tough condition to be in. Yeah. That's a cheery way to start the program, Norm. <laughs> We're off and running. <laughs> <laughs> well, these two verses led Martin Luther to reject this as a biblical book because his whole thing was God Here's a pile of my sins. What am I going to do about this pile of sins? You know, it's only by justification that we can get rid of these sins. And if you once sin and you're rejected by God, once you become a Christian and you step back and there's no way to come back again, there's no hope for sinners, we, we, we can't buy this book. And he, he put Hebrews, James, Jude, Second Peter, and Revelation. He says, I can't find Christ in those books. He put them at the end of his scripture, and didn't include them in the New Testament. He was, they were kind of a New Testament apocrypha from Martin Luther, and it's because of these two verses. What are we going to do with these two passages? Give up and go home. I th Give up and I go think, home. I think this is the ultimate expression of freedom. If you have understood all there is to know, and you reject it, then there is nothing more that you can know to bring you back. It's just perfect logic. Well, don't you have to, if you want your sins taken away, don't you want them taken away? I mean, if you don't want them taken away, well, then why would anybody take them away? And if you, and it seems like if you got that truth and then you went back to what you were doing, you didn't really want that truth in the first place. Well, you can redefine it that way. That's not the way he's doing it here, but I think that's right. Well, I think that's what he's saying. If you, if, if you really, but if you knew all there was to know. I mean, Lucifer knew all there was to know about God. God could not teach him anything more about himself. But Lucifer rejected it. Mm -hmm. And there was no coming back. Well, he's an me, example of what this is talking about. Let, let me read this in a, in a modern version. And you'll see there's a slightly different slant on it, and I think we, we need to pay attention to that slightly different slant. I'm just going to read verse 6 of chapter 6, and then they abandon their faith. It is impossible to bring them back to repent again because they are again crucifying the Son of God and exposing him to public shame. In Greek, there are two ways that you can tell people to, to stop doing something. You can say, don't start, or you can say, don't go on. Now, what, in, in the case of these verbs here, it's saying, don't go on doing it. In other words, if, you're, if you continue crucifying Jesus, and in fact, in fact, keep putting him up to public shame, 
You're ignoring all his advice. You're, you're paying no attention to any of his calls to repentance, etc. What's God supposed to do with you? And we so, go, what you're, so you're saying it's not a, a, a particular sin at a particular time, but it is a rejection of a whole concept. Right, and you're running away from God as fast as you can go. And every time God appeals to you, he say, get lost, go, right. go hang up on your cross. I'm doing my own thing. Go back to chap, look at 10 verse 26. For there is no longer any sacrifice that will take away sins if we purposely go on sinning. Purposely go on sinning after the truth has been made known to us. Well, obviously you don't value righteousness anymore, right? Sure. So and if, you don't, if you don't value it anymore, well then well, how's any sacrifice going to help you? Precisely. Because you don't like it. Yeah, that's, that's it, the it, point. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the, exactly the point. Yeah. So Paul is saying, look, take God's plan seriously. Right. Don't, don't just say, okay, I can take it today and leave it tomorrow and come back the next day. Um, the Jews, uh, we don't have time to read all this, but the Jews, oh, maybe I'll read a little bit of it. The idea that repentance was impossible under certain circumstances, this is taken from uh, a passage from the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament uh, by R.H. Charles, the, 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 the official version of the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. And it's quoted in our SDA Bible commentary, I might add. The idea that repentance was impossible under certain circumstances was current among the Jews. They taught, for example, that such was the case of the man who sinned wantonly, trusting in future repentance. And this, here's a quote from one of these ancient Jewish documents. If one says, I shall sin or repent, sin or repent, no opportunity will be given him to repent. If one says, I shall sin and the Day of Atonement will procure atonement for me, the Day of Atonement procures for him no atonement. That's the Mishma Yoma 8, verse 9, in, in the Sosino so edition of the Talmud. They taught also that repentance was impossible for the man who led, the, who led a multitude into sin. Whoever, and I quote now, whoever causes the many to be righteous, sin occurs not through him. And whoever causes the many to sin, they do not afford him the faculty to repent. Again, Misha Aboth, Mishnah Aboth 5.18. Of interest also is a passage from the book of Sirach. Now this is from the Old Testament Apocrypha, the book of Sirach. Say not, I have sinned, but what happened unto me? For Yahweh is long-suffering. Count not upon forgiveness that thou shouldest add sin to sin. And say not, his mercies are great. He will forgive the multitude of my iniquities. For mercy and wrath are with him, and his indignation abideth upon the ungodly. Delay not to turn unto him, and put it not off from day to day. For suddenly doth his wrath come forth, and in the time of vengeance thou shalt perish. So, remember, these are, this, is, this is the belief of the people that Paul is writing to. Now we, we say, no, that's not inspired. But remember, you have to address the beliefs of the people you're talking to. And this was their belief. It was correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much so. If you, if you keep turning away from God, you will reap the consequences. Well, come back now to chapter 8. Paul turns back to say a little bit more, or quite a bit more, about Melchizedek. I don't know that we really need to, to go there. He's just showing the superiority of Christ and Melchizedek over the Jewish Levitical Aaronic high priesthood. And... I'm going to drop down um, to chapter 8. The whole point of what we are saying is, and what he said so far, we talked about it last week, uh, the whole point from the first seven chapters of, of Hebrews is now being summarized. We have such a high priest who sits at the right of the throne of the divine majesty in heaven. He is a king and he's a priest. He's both. He serves as high priest in the most holy place, that is, the real tent, which was put up by the Lord, not by human hands. Now, over the next two chapters, over the next three chapters, really, we're going to face some really challenging questions. We need to spend a couple, a few minutes on this. Will there be sac animal sacrifices in heaven? No. Absolutely not. What's the point of having a tabernacle with, with an altar, a burnt offering, a labor, a holy place, and a most holy place, 
if there are no sacrifices? Well, there still is sacrifice. I mean, what the, kind of sacrifice? the life that, that is lived in heaven is a sacrifice <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just isn't that kind of a death sacrifice that they're used to doing now. It's not a self-centered life? Well, it's not a self-centered life. It, right. Okay. When, when I said absolutely not, I was referring to the uh, animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. In heaven, it's a model. Mm -hmm. It's like a sandbox for universe to understand okay. the process of redemption. Mm -hmm. It's on the higher level than Moses' level or Solomon's okay. level or ours level. Okay. That means it's a higher level. There are objects there. Mm -hmm. They are not sacrificed because Jesus was enough. So, d so let's talk about that then. Are we saying that the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and kids and so forth in the Old Testament accomplished something and now we don't need to do it, keep doing that because Jesus' blood was was worth a whole lot more and he could accomplish the, all that to one sacrifice? Or what are we saying? Well, it never did accomplish what it was supposed to, what did it? Because they had to sacrifice every <clears throat> year. This was a model that was designed to teach these people that though they were sinners, they could, there was a solution to the sin problem. You're talking about the the sanctuary service. On the earth. On earth, the one out there. Mm -hmm. And in Desire of Ages, uh, the chapter on what is the sanctuary, day by day the repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle and by placing his hands on the victim head, confessed his sins thus in figure, mm -hmm. transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. Innocent. The sin didn't move. There was something that was done as a symbol, as a figure. But what happened was that symbol took his sin off and it went off into a process that he had nothing more to do with. Mm -hmm. And his sin problem was solved. Well, let's review that. What, what happened in the ancient system? And then we'll see how that might fit with the heavenly system. A person would come and say, I'm a sinner. I've committed some wrongs and so forth. He comes, he lays his hands on the head of the lamb. He, he takes the life, of, the priest takes the life of the, of the lamb. He catches some of the blood. He sprinkles it in front of the altar. And then he takes some of it inside and he actually sprinkles it at the base of the, the curtain leading into the most holy place, right? In, in symbol, yes, go ahead. In symbol su suggesting that he's transferred the sins into the temple, into exactly. the tabernacle. By this ceremony, the sin was through the blood transferred in figure mm -hmm. to the sanctuary. Okay. Separated from the, from the sinner off someplace else being taken care of. So the sinner believed now my sins are gone, God is going to take care of it, right? And then on the Day of Atonement, what happened? They cleaned out the sanctuary. There was a huge pile of sins in the sanctuary, right? In figure. In figure. Okay, let's be careful here. And so what did the high priest do? He Went got a lot of... A lot got, well, there was some ceremony. He moved him from there to someplace else that they could take away. He went into that most holy place and he collected those sins in figure, brought them out. What did he do with them? Put them on a goat. scapegoat. Placed them on the head of the scapegoat after he sacrificed other lambs and so forth and so forth. On the head of the scapegoat. And then what happened to the scapegoat? Let out into the wilderness. A person was especially chosen to lead that scapegoat as far away as possible from the camp so that it would never come back. They let loose of it right next to a lion's den. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so salvation is a big shuffle game. Okay, well, so, but in effect, <laughs> hold on now. Be Do you care what it is as long as you can get rid of yours? Well, I wanted to understand it so it makes sense, so I'll okay. believe it. Okay, these people had a language and a thinking that was very concrete. They wanted to see it happen in front of their eyes. What did they see happen? 
they saw their sin go wandering off and they were separated from it and on the day of atonement they were at peace I had a teacher once I won't mention his name because some of you might know him in fact several of you would probably know him he said what would happen if you woke up the next morning after the day of atonement and you found out that that scapegoat had come back and was sitting in your backyard That would be scary. It would be a different goat. In that setting. <laughs> it would be a different goat? Yeah. Sitting, what if it was the same goat? Sitting at the front door to your tent, yeah. Yeah. Well, in the system, it was never to come back. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a theoretical problem that but is... This, yeah, but but this I don't is understand why we need it yet. Okay, yes. This is a system for children. Mm -hmm. If we pass children level will become mature we understand on the higher level mm -hmm. okay and that's exactly what Paul already told us back in chapter 5 and 6 wasn't it and we need to grow up we need to look at this as a higher level so what happens at the higher level well look at chapter 8 now and that's where we started I'm going to pick out a few verses we don't have the time to read the whole thing look at verse 5 Hebrews 8 verse 5 the work they do as priests is really only a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. So there's no scapegoats being carried off or let off somewhere to die in the wilderness in heaven. So how can this be a copy and a shadow of what's happening in heaven? Well, the scapegoat here on earth represented a process that was ha going to happen in heaven. There's a process in heaven well, it's well, kind of like an allegory, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, be careful. <laughs> well, I'll, I'm, I don't have to be careful of that. Allegory is but an allegory. The, the, the process is symbolic okay. of something. Okay. Now, if you're asking what is that something, well, that's what we but, need to know. But, but it doesn't have to be just like this. No. It can, it can, it can look different. Okay, we drop down to verse 7, chapter 8. If there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, there would have been no need for a second one. But God finds fault with his people when he says, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will drop a new covenant and drop down, well, let's, we can read through this, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Now, maybe we should go back there for a second. Keep your finger here in Hebrews Eight and nine, and go back to Exodus. Look at verse nine, chapter nineteen, and verse eight. Um, and I, I guess I better start with verse seven, so you get the context. Exodus nineteen, verse seven. So Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. Then the people answered together. We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Now they hadn't even heard what the Lord was going to have to say yet. And they already had promised anything God tells us, we'll just do it. Short attention span. Well, not only that. <laughs> got, he, Moses trying to start to instruct them. He says, I'll just, we'll just do whatever you say. Yeah. Look over at chapter 24. Now they've heard the Ten Commandments and God is explaining and more about what it meant and, and Moses has come back down and so forth and all that's happened and they've had a chance to think about it. Now we're at chapter 24. Look at verse 3. This is Exodus 24 verse 3. Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances and all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. Moses wrote down all the Lord's commands, etc. Good and intentions. Good intentions. Drop down to verse 7. What do they say? Then he took the book. He said, now I'm going to write it all down. He got up and he said, now let me read you what I've written. Then he took the book of the covenant which the Lord's commands were written and he read it aloud to the people. And they said, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. And how long did that last? About 30 minutes. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit more <laughs> than that, but not much, huh? Eight, For sure. Eight we, hours and 30 minutes if... For Eight sure. hours they slept. Yeah. This, we, this, yeah. Sanct this sanctuary in heaven, when did they build that? The sanctuary in heaven? Yeah. It says that there's this a down here. This is a model of what's up in heaven. Mm -hmm. When did they build the sanctuary in heaven? 
Yeah. I'm suggesting yes. uh -huh. when Adam and Eve transgress mm -hmm. God's word, in heaven was a crisis. Crisis, and Jesus came and explained. They didn't understand, mm -hmm. and He created that sanctuary for people, for intelligence, heavenly intelligence, to understand, and from people from other worlds to understand the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's move on. What does Paul tell us? Fair enough. Uh, they were not faithful, God says back in Hebrews 8. The people were not faithful to the covenant I made with them. In fact, he had said, this is what I would like you to do, and they said, we will do it. So what was, what was wrong with that first covenant? It was based on human promises. And they were completely faulty. They fell apart in almost no time. The second covenant is quite different. Where is the second covenant found? Jeremiah 31. But actually it was first given to Abraham. God made a collection of promises to Abraham. And we don't have time to go into all the intricacies of that. But look back at Jeremiah 31 real quick. Jeremiah 31 starting with verse 31. Jeremiah 31. I'm going to start with verse 31. <coughs> That's really just a restatement of what he did before. The people didn't yeah. it, it didn't follow through the first time, so he says, "Well, I'll try it again." Well, but it's quite different this time. The Lord, and, and I agree that it's, he's he's trying again. The Lord says, "The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt." And that was what we were talking about there at Foot of Sinai, wasn't it? Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. We know that's true, don't we? The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach, his neighbor, teach a neighbor to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord have spoken. Who's doing all the action in this covenant? The Lord. Right. The Lord. How does that relate to the path that we were following of sin? Okay, that's where we need to go. Yeah, and um, I guess I don't have to do anything. Well, not quite that simple. <laughs> and um, it sounds like the Lord's going to do everything right. Mm -hmm. That that before they said they would do it because they kind of looked at it as just some action that they'd have to perform and we can do that but then they find out that they didn't really want to do that and so they didn't do it so now you got the Lord coming down through spirit right and he's gonna write it in their hearts mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen now okay. we just we just talked a little while ago why this hasn't happened yet mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like the Lord hasn't come down in spirit to write it down in our hearts yet. Well, let's, let's, let's give Paul a chance. Let's give the author of Hebrews, and I keep referring to Paul because I believe he did this, probably working with Luke. I, I really think that Paul and Luke were working together here. He was, he was doing his thing, and, and, and Luke says, let me write that down in nice, polished Greek. And Paul says, that sounds like a good idea to me. You write it down. I'll speak it, and you write it down. By the way, if you're interested in getting the handout that we're sort of working our way through here that's a lot of material about Hebrews and so forth, it will be available on our website, theox.org. That's Theological Crossroads. We shorten it to theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You'll find it there. Coming back to Paul's words now, by speaking of a new covenant, God has made the first one old, and anything that becomes old and worn out will soon disappear. So the old covenant didn't work. God says, throw it out. It's not, it's not of any value to any more, anymore. So then he starts for chapter 9. The first covenant had rules for worship and a place made for worship as well. And what did he say about that first covenant? It's, it's about to disappear, right? So, chapter 9 is talking about something that's about to disappear, right? Yeah. Let's be clear. 
Well, this is how those things have been arranged. Look at verse 6. This is how those things have been arranged. The priests go into the outer tent every day to perform their duties. But only the high priest goes into the inner tent, and he does so only once a year. We know that that was the instructions. He takes with him blood which he offers to God on behalf of himself and for the sins which the people have committed without knowing they were sinning. What? Without knowing they were sinning? Sounds like uh, in the book of Job. Job did a lot of uh, sacrifice for his sons and daughters in case they did something that perhaps they didn't realize. How serious is sin? Deadly. You sure? So, sin. so they were doing sins that they didn't realize they were doing. So, isn't the definition of sin the separation between them and God? Mm -hmm. So, they were separated from God and they didn't know that they mm -hmm. were separated. Look at Numbers. Way back, Moses wrote these words way back in the book of Numbers, starting with verse 27. If any of you sin unintentionally, you are to offer a one-year-old female goat as a sin offering. At the altar, the priest shall perform the ritual of purification to purify you from your sin, and you will be forgiven. The same regulation applies to all who unintentionally commit a sin, whether they are native Israelites or resident foreigners. But any who sin deliberately, whether they are natives or foreigners, are guilty of treating the Lord with contempt, and they shall be put to death because they have rejected what the Lord said and have deliberately broken one of his commands, they are responsible for their own death. What, can you, the, what does he mean by deliberately? I mean, when you steal something, you deliberately do it, mm -hmm. so then there's no sacrifice for it. Is that continuing notion that you had before about sinning continuing? or yeah, it was in Greek. This is Hebrew. Well, do they have the same concept? No. How do they talk about something that continues on? Well, I'm not an expert at Hebrew, so I probably shouldn't speak about that. But, um, you know, he's talking about unintentional and intentional sins here. And I'm still trying to find out a definition of that. What what you mean by that? Because what? if you, you could ha actually have an intentional <laughs> sin because you're rich enough to pay for it. Mm -hmm. at yeah. the end. Okay, okay that's so that exactly would make what he's it... talking about. He's saying a lot of Jews came to the conclusion, now if I got enough lambs in my flock, I can pretty much do what I want. You know, rush down to the tabernacle. That's a real intentional sin there, yeah. even though you're not really talking about the sin. Like you're... an indulgence. How yeah. many, how, but how many of us today are deliberately selfish, covetous? Well, everybody... How can you sin without deliberately doing it, if you use that word in that way? Mm -hmm. But if you deliberately do it because you know you can pay your way out of it, that's another, that's another way of yeah. looking at deliberate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what about, what about ooh, we're, we're, we're getting short on time. What about, what about when you sin and you don't know it and you, and you never find out about it? It's, it's something you never become conscious of. Well, one of the issues, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this when we come back. One of the issues is maybe you're damaging yourself, even your conscience, by deliberately doing something that you know is wrong, and that's what God is warning you against. You're damaging yourself by deliberately doing something that you know is wrong. In other words, you're breaking down the barriers that protect you. Think about that for a moment, and we will be right back.
We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're in the middle of a thick out of, of challenges here in understanding the book of Hebrews. It says, people, sins which pe the people have committed without knowing they are sinning. The Holy Spirit, reading on, I'm reading now Hebrews 9, verse 8, the Holy Spirit clearly teaches from all these arrangements that the way into the most holy place has not yet been opened as long as the outer tent still stands. This is a symbol which uh, points to the present time. It means that the offerings and animal sacrifices presented to God cannot make the worshiper's heart perfect, since they have to do only with food, drink, and various purification ceremonies. These are all outward rules which apply only until the time when Christ will establish the new order. Did those sacrifices work or not? No, they never got rid of a sin. We're going to get over to chapter 10 in a little bit, and we'll see exactly what Paul says about that. Well, as far as educational goes, uh, did it work in that way? Well, it was a symbol. It was a figure. It served a purpose. Yeah. yeah. But he goes on now, verse 11, But Christ has already come as the high priest of the good things that are already here. The tent in which he serves is greater and more perfect. It is not a tent made by human hands. That is, it is not a part of this created world. So now he's talking about which tent? The one in heaven, right? Um, when Christ went through the tent and entered once for all into the most holy place, he did not take the blood of bull, goats and bulls to offer as a sacrifice. Rather, he took his own blood and obtained eternal salvation for us. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If the blood of bulls and goats didn't work, does the blood of Christ work? It's a symbol well, it too. It yes. said right there. It's a symbol too. It's a symbol. Symbol of his character, his willingness to forgive the past. If the if the blood represents his salvation experience of his life, his death, his resurrection, his work in heaven, is that's what's represented by the blood? Yes, it works. Okay. So, let's read on and see what Paul says. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a burnt calf, I'm reading verse 13, are sprinkled on the people who are ritually unclean, and this purifies them by taking away their ritual impurity. Since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? Now remember that blood, you can go all the way to Genesis 9 verse 4, blood represents life, right? Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals so that, they, that we may serve the living God. How does his blood purify our consciences from useless rituals? Well, there's power in the blood. The song says so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now I'm asking you how that works. Well, if it's a law that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And God, as our parent, has a duty to teach, and that's what he did. He, by, he, the ultimate demonstration is how God operates in, in the relationship to sin was his life, Jesus' life and death. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the life and death of Jesus now, if we learn something from it, takes the place of the the blood of the lambs and the goats and the bulls, right? That's reasonable, and I think that uh, if we, you need to have his life, because remember in John 17, he hadn't even died yet, and he says he's accomplished the work he, the Father had given him to do, which was to show what God is like. And if you take that out of context, excuse me, if, if we put the death experience Oh, and don't, if you don't have it in the context of his life, it's it's it yeah. give you a distorted picture. I guess of what I'm trying to say. So you're not really talking about execution here. You're well, talking on. about you're talking about life. Let, let's let's think about that now. It's time for us. We're getting near the end of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to put together everything we've talked about in Scripture and come to some conclusions. Adam and Eve sinned. God had said what? You will surely die. If you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. In fact, you will die the same day. It's an emphatic, you will die. And death is a process. Okay. 
And so God says, no, you can't stay in the garden any longer because you sinned. He takes them outside. And what's one of the very first things he does? He teaches them to offer animal an sacrifices. Ob an object lesson. And what are we supposed to learn? What should we have learned from all those sacrifices in the Old Testament? That sin is deadly. That sin is deadly. That is the number one lesson we're supposed to have learned. Have we learned that lesson? No. We're do pretty, we? We're pretty comfortable with a lot of sin. Do we live lives in the 21st century? If someone looked at our lives and they really could look at it in detail, if we had that kind of divine insight, would we say, yeah, he's obviously, he or she is obviously living a life that he believes, she believes that sin is deadly? Well, believing something and actually performing a certain way isn't going to be the same thing, is it, all the time? I, I, I that's mean, what you're I'm saying asking. that. That's what I'm asking. Oh, well, I would say no. You would say no. <laughs> you can, what happens if you believe one thing and you do something different? We just talked about that a moment ago. That's sinning intentionally. Well, if you don't believe, if you, if you don't like sin... And you're still doing it. Do we have a that happens in right now, isn't it? Do we have anything that, in Scripture that talks about that? What do you mean? Most of the chapter, Romans seven, Paul says, "I really want to do everything that God tells me to do, but just can't." That's right. Need time. What time and experience? Uh -huh. Now, would we say that Paul is a hopeless sinner? In, I'm sorry, where? Hebrews 7? He didn't no, refer no, to Paul. Romans right. 7. Romans 7, okay. Therefore there is laid up for me a crown. He didn't think that. Yeah. And then... He said it. It's right there in the inspired record. Oh, I know he said it. That gives us hope also. Okay. Okay, so hope he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to do it, but he does it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's just what you were talking about. Is that possible? Okay, now we've got <laughs> about 20 minutes left. <laughs> we have to get the rest, of, we have to get the rest of, of Hebrews 9 and 10 at least in here. For this reason, I'm reading starting from verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the one who arranges a new covenant so that those who have been called by God may receive the eternal blessings that God has promised. This can be done because there has been a death which sets people free from the wrongs they did while their first covenant was in effect. So we, if we recognize that death is a result of sin and we absolutely hate it to the best of our ability we do our very best to avoid it it goes on in the case of a will it is necessary to prove that the person who made it has died for a will means nothing with the person who, who made it is alive it goes into effect only after his death that is why even the first covenant went into effect only with the use of blood and Paul goes on to discuss that and then uh, Starting from verse 20, he said, This is the blood which seals the covenant that God has commanded you to obey. Quoting from the Old Testament. And the same way Moses also sprinkled the blood on the sacred tent and over the, all the things used in worship. Indeed, according to the law, in my book, in my version, it's laws capitalized. What does that mean? But the Pen Pentateuch. It means the entire, all five books of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, including the ceremonial law, right? Indeed, according to all the law, the five books of Moses, almost everything is purified by blood, and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. That's according to the Old Testament system, right? And, and according to the New Testament system. Okay, now we've got to find out if that's true. As what Paul is saying here is that's not really the, way it's the, really the way it's done. It's that when you look at the Old Testament system, that's the way it was done. The question is how does that blood work? Yes. Not whether we agree that it works. I mean, but the question is how, by what mechanism does it, does it accomplish its purpose? So we read on. Those things which are copies of the heavenly originals had to be purified in that way, but the heavenly things themselves require much better sacrifices. Now, is this just a better quality blood, or what's happening here? For Christ did not go into a holy place made by human hands, which is a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. The Jewish high priest goes into the most holy place every year with the blood of an animal. 
But Christ did not go in to offer himself many times, for he, then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of the world. Instead, now when all ages of time are nearing the end, he has appeared once and for all to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. To remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. How does that work? Everyone must die once, and after that be judged by God. In the same manner Christ also was offered and sacrificed once, to take away the sins of many, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, Romans 8, verse 3, you can go back there, but to save those who are waiting for him. And then Paul says, now let's get down to how it works. The Jewish law is not, notice an N-O-T, not a full and faithful model of the real things. So we've got to, we under, got to something more. We've got to understand something more than what happened out there in the tent in the wilderness, right? So, so the blood that's being shed back in the olden times, I mean, mm -hmm. within the in the um, you know sacrificial system, doesn't do as much as the new one does. The new blood that's being sacrificed. It's not a full and faithful model. Yeah. It's okay. not full. It is only a faint outline. It how, was how, a symbol. That's all it was. Yeah. It's a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who come to God? If the people worshiping God had really been purified from their sins, they would not feel guilty of sin anymore, and all sacrifices would stop. Paul says, think about it. If those, that system really worked to eliminate sin completely, how many times would you need to come back and offer more sacrifices? Wouldn't be necessary. You would never need to come back again, right? Well, you would, if that he system said, worked. If that system worked. But he's going to talk about a system where there is only one sacrifice. Okay, and so we read <laughs> on. Okay, as it is, however, the sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins. For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. How often did they work? Never. Never. What was their purpose? To remind people of sins. By the way, Ellen White suggests in Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1, that uh, by beholding we become changed. The things we focus on, that's what we become like. If the blood of bulls and goats is a constant reminder of sin, what's it doing to us? If, if the blood and bulls and goats, its, its purpose is to remind people of our sins. Uh, yes, but what, when we are reminded of our sins, we are supposed to go running to Jesus. Okay. So we shouldn't be focusing on the blood of bulls and goats. No. Or even what those bulls and goats' blood was supposed to have accomplished. No, because that was all symbols. Nothing, in fact, happened with okay. that. Okay. For this reason, I'm reading on, for this reason, the fact that it didn't work, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you have prepared a body for me. You are not pleased with animals burnt whole on the altar or with sacrifices to take away sins. Then I said, here I am to do your will, O God, just as it is written of me in the book of the law. First, he said, you neither want nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or with animals burned on the altar and the sacrifices to take away sins. Hold on, I thought we had a better sacrifice. God isn't pleased with sacrifices? He said this even though all these sacrifices are offered according to the law. Then he said, here I am, O God, to, to do your will. So God does away with all the old sacrifices and puts the sacrifice of Christ in their place. Because Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified from sin by the offering that he made of his own body once and for all. He still haven't, hasn't told us exactly how it works, but he's about to. Every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times. But these sacrifices, and this is about the fourth or fifth time he said it, but these sacrifices can never take away sins. What do they do? They just remind us of sin. Okay? Um, so in reality, from time immemorial, 
any sin has a record in heaven. Yes. Not only that, it, it, those sacrifices remind us of how serious sin is. The reason those sacrifices are important is they re, they're supposed to remind us every time we think about them, sins are deadly, sins are deadly, sins are deadly, sins are deadly. Right. That's what we're supposed to learn. Well, I think also that the message here in this system was that sins are deadly. There's no doubt about that. But there's also going to be something that's going to take care of those yeah. things. Okay, we're going to read about that. But let's not forget the first, in, I mean, the whole entire Old Testament system. Let's not forget what we're supposed to learn from that. Okay, so he goes on. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sins, an offering that is effective forever, and then he sat down at the right side of God. So whatever Christ did, took care of it, right? There he now waits until God puts his enemies as a footstool under his feet. With one sacrifice, then, he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. And the Holy Spirit also gives us his witness. First he says, now, now let's, let's stop and hold on for a second. There's a couple ways that this has been understood down through history. The typical way it's been understood is that we don't ask any questions. We don't need to know. God has taken care of it. Close your eyes and just say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Is that what's being suggested here? I think he has something more to say. He's not done yet. Now he's going to take us back to Jeremiah 31. And look what it says. And the Holy Spirit also gives us his witness. First he says, This is the covenant that I will make with them. And he quotes Jeremiah 31. In the days to come, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. So God is going to do something as a result, presumably, of the sacrifice that Jesus has done. He's going to teach us something important about himself and about how he deals with sins, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what, how, does it, how does that happen? And then he says, reading on in Jeremiah, I will not remember their sins and evil deeds any longer. What a strange way. You know, back in, in, in um, it's in... Um, Isn't, wouldn't that be equal to the removal or blotting out, if he doesn't remember them, isn't that effectually blotted out and gone? Well, the Old Testament talks about throwing the sins into the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Psalms talks about removing them as far as the east is from the west. That was the, wasn't that the message of the, of the scapegoat? The sins are gone. Yes. Yeah. But why would God say, why doesn't he just say, I've thrown them into the bottom of the ocean. I put them on the scapegoat. They're gone. Why does he say, I will not remember their sins and evil deeds any longer? Because that's the most important part. What is? That he doesn't remember them. and He, he's not, he is not going to treat us on the basis of those sins and what we deserve on the basis of those. Okay. Does he get the amnesia because of the... Um, okay, hold on. <laughs> this is very... The wording here is essential. He does not say... I will forget. Mm -hmm. He says, I will not remember. There's a very subtle but a very important difference. What's the difference? Remember to you. Yes. Basically, he's saying is, there's nothing faulty with my memory. But I I'm won't just, confront you. I won't. Them. We won't even discuss it. It doesn't matter. Right. See, it does. So in other words, God is saying, what matters is not your past sins. What matters is how you're going to live in the future. So if we can come to an agreement, if we can see something, if we can learn from everything that happened in the Old Testament, if we especially can learn from the life and death of Jesus, something important that helps us to work toward a life where we no longer sin, then we're savable. Christ's life and his death give us a choice. Here's the choice. We can choose to live the kind of life which he lived, we may fail. God says, that's fine. Let me help you up. Try again. Fall down. I'll help you up. Fall again. Help you up. Fall again. Help you up. But we're doing what? We're looking at the life of Jesus and we're focusing on that and we're saying, I'm going to do my very best to live that kind of life. Or 
The other choice is, we will die the kind of death which he died. Live we, his life or die his death. That's the choice. Are we looking at that because of his blood now? Does his blood cause us to look at that? That's what he's saying. He's saying, look at my death. What are you, what are you learning from my death? Yeah. Remember he said back in the beginning, if you sin, you will die. And when, when Cain killed Abel, I'm sure the angels rushed to God and said, is that what you meant? God says, no, it's not what I'm talking about. People started dying after a thousand years or so. Adam died, Eve died, da-da-da. People started dying. And every time someone died, they run to God and they said, is that what you meant? No, no. The, the flood comes along and all but eight people die. And they said, is that what you're talking about? No, I'm still, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sin, the, I'm sorry, the death, which is a direct result of sin. Well, when do we get to see that? Well, hold on, the time hasn't come yet. When do we get to see that? The firstborn all die in Egypt. Is that what you talked about? The angel of God went down there and killed them. No, that's still not what I'm talking about. Every one of those people, everybody who died in the flood, all the firstborn in Egypt are going to rise again, and they're going to appear either outside the city or inside the city at the end. Okay, so something's going to happen with his blood that's mm -hmm. going to make God not bring up sin anymore in my life, what, what I've done in my life. In the right? Yes. Okay. Is that what you're as saying? A following, uh, as there's a There's something in the blood. No. There's something in the yeah. blood or what's happening here that's going to, to end up God saying, I won't remember your sins anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's but. not in the blood, but it's in what the blood stands for. Yeah. In his life his redemptive acts here on earth, his death, his resurrection. There is something in that which can do away with our sin and he won't remember it. Now, but it's not, it's not moving hemoglobin someplace. Well, I, you just, you didn't like my preposition. That's what you're saying. Well, maybe you like so. Mm -hmm. But, well, the, the point is, the life and death of, Je of Jesus, and let me say it again, his, specifically his death, when Jesus died on the cross, actually, Ellen White says, and the Bible hints at, but you have to read sorry, between the lines to get this information, Jesus died the death that results from sin in the Garden of Gethsemane. An angel had to come and revive him. And, and how many people had attacked him by that point? How many beatings had he had suffered? How many crowns of thorns had he worn? None. But God says, I can't leave him there. People would come along and they would say, oh, he must have had a heart attack. I can't, we, the universe saw what happened, but we had not a clue. So God says, let's go through the whole thing. D let's see if he dies as a result of beatings, if he dies as a result of the, thorn of the crown of thorns. No. When he got out there on the cross, what did he say? What was the result of his death on the cross? Broken heart. He gave his own life. But Separation. he says something very specifically. Matthew 27, Forgive 46. Me. What? Forgive me. Yes. Now, that was, that was a little bit earlier. That's when they were still crucifying him. Yeah, what did he have? It, what it did is he say? finished. Just, huh? It is finished. And just before that. Because that something was... Something about the father. He couldn't see his father anymore. Psalm 22. Well, it's quoted from Psalm 22. Psalm... Matthew 27, 46, and let's just look at 45. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness which lasted for three hours. God says, no human being has a clue about what's happening here. There's no reason to, to leave the, the lights on. The universe can watch. And the universe, what, were the, what was the universe watching? They were not, not just watching Jesus dying. They were watching what was the Father doing? They were watching what were the good angels doing. They were watching the devil. What was the devil doing? They were watching what the evil angels were doing. And they got there. The whole universe was, their eyes were glued on that cross, what was happening there. And what did they learn? Much more than us. Sin what? causes death. Sin here is a direct result for the first time. Sin itself directly cause it. Jesus didn't die of crucifixion. Crucifixion diet in crucifixion takes two or three days. You hang up there and finally you graduate sort of uh, 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 finally you die. Jesus was dead in six hours. He died 
of sin. So you have a choice. And you not look his at, own sin. It was collateral no. damage of well, sin. He was yeah. made sin. He was made to be sin. Second Corinthians 5.21. He was made to be sin. God says, I want to show you what happens when a person is, and, and what does sin do to us? That was clearly spelled out way back in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah 59, verse 2. 59, verse 2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. What does sin do to us? Separates, life, separates us life. from God. And where does our life come from? God. If we separate from life, what happens? Yeah. We die. There's a quick little difference between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary that goes on now. In the earthly sanctuary, individual sins were not dealt with. They were all handled as a group. But in the process that's going on now, mm -hmm. there is individual individuals. <laughs> Each individual is having everything, having his life looked at. That didn't happen individually in the old, in the old system. I didn't, we got slightly distracted there. We talked about the darkness of flash dead for three hours. I need to read you the next verse, Matthew 27, 46. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Now, there are many people who believe that Jesus died under the wrath of God. Is that true? Separation from God. Depends how you define wrath. Yeah. And God's wrath all the way through the Old Testament, starting with Genesis and in, in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and especially in Joshua and Judges, God's wrath is his withdrawing himself and letting us reap the consequences of our own rebellious choices. So here Jesus has demonstrated that. And if we don't learn from God himself coming down and doing all of that from, uh, for us, God says, you know, there, there, there's nothing more I can do for you. If you aren't willing to pay attention to the sacrifice of my son, I'm out of options. I can't say anything more plainly than that. And then Christ, of course, on Sunday morning, rose in his own power to prove that he was God. He could do that. We can't. Think about it. We'll see you next week.